Well, Philip Ruddock, somewhere in the tail end of last week, the mood seemed to change in Australia and elsewhere around the world when it came to recognising the scale of the Syrian refugee problem, possibly because of scenes from Hungary, uh, but also the, uh, the drowning death of a baby boy. What do you think the meaningful contribution should be that Australia can make here? Well, I think it's very important to understand the enormity of the problem we're facing. The world has not seen anything of this size and dimension. It's, it's, it's not been something you've discovered last week. It's been happening now for several years. Um, I've viewed the outflow in places like Jordan when I went there back in 2013. Uh, I saw it again when I went to Lebanon, Jordan and Turkey at the end of last year, 2014. Um, a problem in 2013 that people thought may be resolved within a year. Um, people a year ago were saying there is no prospect of settlement. You think about the kids. I mean, we've got something like 14 million Syrians displaced now. Half of them would be children. What sort of future are they going to have? What sort of education are they going to have? If you're worried about radicalisation now amongst populations, how ripe is this population for future radicalisation? So what should the West do about this? Yes, there's counter-radicalisation, but more importantly, what do you do about 14 million people? The international community has never dealt with those sort of numbers before. No, and, uh, and look, I mean, I, I suggested some 12 months ago that we could help keep borders open so people could flee um, to Jordan, to Lebanon, to Turkey, if Australia had safe haven arrangements in place and was burden sharing. I mean, that report um, tabled in the parliament um, is now largely forgotten, although people take up safe haven arrangements. It was relevant for the time, but I think we've moved on. This crisis is now so much larger, we ought to be playing a role in galvanising the international community to finding a solution. You have places like Russia, China, with populations that are being radicalised, Chetnians, um, uh, Uyghurs, uh, for them, um, uh, they're involved. Uh, Iran is involved. Um, and on the other side, you've got uh, Saudi Arabia, um, Qatar, uh, Turkey trying to overthrow a regime supported by the United States. Um, each of them have got different objectives. There is a stalemate. There has to be a way through and it needs good officers diplomatically to work on these issues to solve the problem for the world. Yeah. Otherwise, it will remain with us, not just for a year or two, it will be with us for generations. And it sounds like Australia is engaging with Peter Dutton and Julie Bishop involved in some of those conversations already. Can I just take you back to the concept of safe havens? You're saying the world has moved on from when you first advocated this. Does that mean it's not a live option or shouldn't be, in your no, opinion? It, it's, look, I mean, look at the numbers. Um, we might take 10,000. It's a drop in the ocean of the flood that we are seeing right now. We can't, through the sorts of arrangements that we would put in place, uh, do other than to demonstrate um, that we care and we're prepared to take some. But fundamentally, and this issue needs to be addressed by the world community coming together to say we have to find a solution. And just to take people through the safe haven model as it operated when I think you were minister uh, with Kosovars, how might that look if Australia did, say, 10,000 of those? How long do you think they could uh, be held in Australia or given safe haven in Australia, then what happens to them at the expiration of that visa? Well, you look back at what happened with Kosovo. There was an expectation that the matter would be resolved. It wasn't a matter that was likely to run on for decades. Um, it was an expectation that if you took people um, and gave them sanctuary for a time, they'd be able to return home. And so safe haven visas were temporary protection visas. And the purpose was to ensure that the countries surrounding and they were Macedonia and Albania, left their borders open because they were closing their borders because of the large numbers of people moving. Now we're in a situation where, um, yes, if it's necessary to keep borders open so that people can flee to Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, um, you might put in place safe haven arrangements. But for how long? I don't know how long this is going to go. Is this going to be another year or two? Um, if it was, I would say it's the appropriate option. If it's not, 
then you have to look at a longer term solution and that's a very much more difficult and issue. And few are predicting any immediate or near term resolution to this. So would that then disqualify uh, safe haven visas, temporary protection visas as an option in this case? Look, I mean, the reason you use temporary protection visas is that you have an expectation that people will, when the issue resolves itself, will be able to go home. That's the judgment that has to be made. Um, in terms of taking people at the moment, um, there are large numbers of people, I see them in my office every day, um, families who have relatives um, whom they say, we would be prepared to support. I think we need to be looking at some of the other options um, as well that we have flagged uh, in the uh, in the earlier periods of allowing sponsorship by those who say we will support family members who are in refugee-like situations and that does give you a degree of flexibility in terms of uh, costs. Um, that's of on an understanding the that they, they go home? No, when that's on an understanding that the relatives here um, if the family members are sponsored by them in a humanitarian program and they get earlier access, uh, they pick up the responsibility for health costs um, and supporting them, providing accommodation and the like. It does give you a capacity to do more. What about the conventional humanitarian intake and projected increases there? It looks like we're climbing to about 18,000 by uh, about three years from now, I think. Uh, can that be bolstered significantly? And if so, to what sort of numbers? Well, the government, as I understand it, was able to increase the program numbers because we'd stop boat arrivals and the costs associated with that. So there were savings that you could put into it. What's not generally recognised is that Australia, when it settles refugees, offers a very comprehensive set of programs to ensure they're able to settle successfully. And it includes accommodation, it includes giving access to health, um, often social security benefits. Um, it includes programs to teach them English, um, help them to work out how they're going to get their licence and other registrations and so on. When the cost of settling people runs into sometimes, if you're talking thousands of people, billions of dollars. So there is a very significant budgetary cost associated with doing the settlement effectively. And, and does well. that prohibit going no, over and above? No, it means you then have to find the resources to be able to do it. Um, what it may mean that Australia has to go and borrow more money internationally to be able to settle large numbers of people. I mean, it, I, I heard um, 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 one of the independents in the uh, Senate arguing you could increase the numbers by further cutting overseas aid. I mean, they may be options. Uh, I'm not suggesting any of those ways forward. My, my principal concern now is that Australia should be using its good offices to try and produce a resolution to this crisis because if it goes on for another 10, 15 years, um, these young people that are going to be so radicalised, so marginalised, are going to be a long-term problem for the world community to manage. But if they've just fled uh, extreme Islamic marauding fighters, why would they then be open to radicalisation within, I think you're suggesting, some of the camps and the unsatisfactory conditions and that Europe. they're living in? Um, and wherever they go. I mean, these are young people in the main who are not going to get effective access to education and to opportunities. And the potential for radicalisation is uh, very significant. Look, they may get a reasonable education for the small numbers that will be settled in uh, parts of uh, Northern Europe. For those that we take, um, there may be opportunities. Uh, what you're looking at in, um, in Jordan and in Turkey and in Lebanon are millions. That's what you're looking at right now. What you're looking at in terms of Syria itself is a very large number of people displaced internally. No education, no future opportunities. Um, how do you think they're going to respond to that sort of situation? It looks like a, a long legacy left in this. No matter when the conflict ends, there is a lot of questions uh, still to be answered on this. So, uh, Philip Ruddock, thanks for your perspectives today. It's a pleasure.